Worship for Sunday, November the 29th, 2020, the first Sunday of Advent, the beginning of year B. Stir up your power and come. Isaiah wants God to rip the heavens open. Isaiah cries out for an apparently distant, angry God to show up, to save, to restore. When we hear Jesus describing the coming of the Son of Man with stars falling from heaven, it can sound dire and horrible, not like anything we would ever hope for. But when we really look at the suffering of people God loves, we can share the hope that God would tear open the heavens and come. The Lord be with you. As we gather to worship in various places, may we be blessed by God who forms us in word, sacrament, and community. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Stephen Weber from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Ontario, and I'm glad to have you join us for worship today. Our Christmas Eve video later this month will include Holy Communion. You're welcome to take part at home at that time as you watch the Christmas Eve video by having ready the elements such as bread and wine. Katrina, our organist, was in isolation this past week after having been exposed to COVID, so was unable to provide a prelude and postlude today. So far, she's feeling well, and we pray that she stays well. Thank you to Kurt Horup for recording many of the video segments for today's worship. Thank you also to our reader for today, Josh Hyde. Offering envelopes for 2021 are now available at the church. If you have a key, you're welcome to help yourself to your envelopes, which are on a table in the secretary's office. If you don't have a key, please phone or email the church office to arrange a pickup time. When you get your envelopes, we'd appreciate it if you could also take the envelopes of friends and family to deliver. And if you haven't had envelopes in the past, but would like a set now, please contact Sue Brethauer, our financial secretary. When you pick up your envelopes, please also get a copy of the Gifts from the Heart catalog from Canadian Lutheran World Relief, also available at their website, clwr.org. Contact details for all this are on the last screen of today's worship video or in the weekly bulletin available on our website. In these difficult times, if you find that you need someone to talk to, or if you need any assistance, please email me or phone me at the church office and I will help. Each month, our Eastern Synod provides us with a mission minute to celebrate the work we do together. Today, we give thanks that our benevolence gifts through the Eastern Synod support the work of Congregational Redevelopment Services, led by Karen Bierland, past CEO of Faith Life Financial. This ministry helps congregations use the equity built up in their property to support their ministries. Thank you for your gifts to others through your benevolence offerings, which do indeed make a difference in people's lives. Hi, I'm Karen Bierland, Congregational Redevelopment Advisor serving the Eastern Synod. I come to this work with a passion for helping congregations discover solutions where mission and capital resources meet community opportunities. As you know, the need for change among, among many of our congregations is pressing. Membership and income are declining while property values continue to increase. Without knowing what options might be available to them, many congregations fear their only choice is to sell the property and close the church. There are other options. Congregational Redevelopment Services works with congregations to find solutions that honor their visions and identify a clear and achievable pathway forward with the goal of growing ministry and financial sustainability. Just a couple of examples. St. Paul's in Bridgeport has partnered with Menno Homes, a Christian nonprofit, to build affordable housing on the church property. Phase one of the project will include 45 affordable housing units 
and St. Paul's will have brand new flexible worship and meeting space within the housing complex. As part of the redevelopment of St. Philip's in Kitchener, Anishinaabeg Outreach, or AO, purchased St. Philip's building and property. AO created a facility that houses an Indigenous-led daycare, employment agency, and programming for at-risk youth. In the words of AO's CEO, Stephen Jackson, this has been transformative. And with some of the proceeds of the sale, St. Philip's merged with nearby St. Luke's Lutheran, strengthening their combined ministry. If your congregation would like to rethink its vision and repurpose its property to be Christ's church in fresh ways for your community, send me a note or give me a call. My contact information is on the Synod website. Let's start the conversation and thank you for your continued support of this ministry. At whatever time and location you are accessing this, thank you for doing so. It is good to be together in whatever way possible in this time of physical distancing. We continue now with worship. In this season of Advent, this time of transition and beginning, of expectation and deep, deep longing, we turn to the Holy Trinity, source of life and hope, in whose name we gather. Through the water of creation and cleansing, through the word of promise and welcome, we are immersed in the death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. We offer our praise and thanksgiving for the gift of baptism. Gracious and loving one, creator of all, we give thanks for the water which surrounds us, flows within us, falls from the sky to nourish the earth, gathers in pools and lakes, streams and rivers to support life and provide cleansing. Hear us as we pray. Come to us, creator of life. Gracious and loving one, word of life, we give thanks for Jesus, who washed dirty feet and blinded eyes, who washes away disgrace and division, who welcomes us in the flowing promise and the hope of new creation. Hear us as we pray. Come among us in the new Gracious and loving one, spirit of reconciliation, we give thanks for your promised presence, the assurance of companionship on our journey, the calling to work for justice and peace, and the quiet anticipation of the coming reign of God. Hear us as we pray. Come and fill us, Holy Spirit. Gracious and loving one, one God, we wait hopefully, we wait expectantly, we wait joyfully for your promised dawning, begun, continued, and completed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Come and fill us, Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers, and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'm so very glad that you're here today, and I know that you're bringing sunshine and joy wherever you are. I want to start today by wishing you all a happy new year. Today is a new church year, and the new church year begins with the season of Christmas. The next four weeks are called Advent, and during those four weeks, we'll look forward to the coming of Christmas, and we'll watch and we'll wait for Jesus coming into our lives today. As we look forward to Christmas, we have a kind of backwards countdown. Now, all of you know how a regular countdown goes, say like when a rocket is about to take off. So let's do a regular countdown together. Say it with me. 10, 9, 8, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Lift off. Well, if a regular countdown begins at 10 and goes backwards to one, how do you think a backwards countdown might start? This backward countdown starts at one, goes up to four, and ends not with liftoff, but with Christmas, like this. One, two, three, four, Christmas. Let's say that together. One, two, three, four, Christmas. And to help us keep track of where we are in that backwards countdown, we have an advent wreath. Today, the countdown starts at one. Uh, next Sunday, we'll light two candles, and the more candles are lit, the closer it means we're getting to Christmas. So I'm going to light one candle. Each week, we'll sing a verse from a hymn, Light One Candle to Watch for Messiah. Uh, it's number 240 in our worship books and on the screen. Today, we'll sing the first stanza. Light one candle to watch for Messiah. Let the light vanish darkness. He shall bring salvation to Israel. God fulfills the promise. Prayer that God would come with power and compassion. This lament comes from a people who have had their hopes shattered. The visions of a rebuilt Jerusalem and a renewed people of God, spoken of in Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, have not been realized. Instead, the people experience ruin, conflict, and famine. This lament calls God to account, to be the God who has brought deliverance in the past. A reading from Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when a fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on, our on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us, and you have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord. And do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of the Lord. A cry we make our own For we are lost, alone, afraid And far away from home The evil lurks within, without it 
threatens to destroy the fragile chords that make us one that bind our hearts in joy your grace oh god seems far away will healing ever come our broken lives lie broken still will night give way to dawn how can we hope how can we sing oh god set free our voice to name the soul that we might yet rejoice. How long, O oh God, the psalmist cries, a cry we make our own. Though we are lost, alone, afraid, our God will lead us home. Gifts of grace sustain those who wait for the end. As the Christians in Corinth await the advent of Jesus, Paul reminds them how the Lord has already enriched them through spiritual gifts and will continue to strengthen them until the coming day of the Lord. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus, for in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Word of the Lord. The Sudden Coming of the Son of Man Jesus encourages his followers to look forward to the day when he returns in power and glory to end all suffering. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said, In those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds, with great power and glory, then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. The Sermon 
hope even when it's dark. Over the years, I've asked myself many times, would losing Kieran have been easier if I had believed in God? Would losing Kieran have been easier if I had believed in God? That was the opening question of an interesting article I read in a bereavement resource newsletter. The article was written by a woman whose third child had died. Would knowing that my daughter was in good hands and that one day I would see her again have been any comfort? Or that she was important to someone more powerful than I? Or that the devastating event was meant to be? that in the long run it was for the best? Would any of this have made it an easier year? Most of the time, my answer has been no, wrote this mother. And then she continued, while I have met other grieving atheists and agnostics who have said that religion might have helped them, I doubt that it would have helped me. What I wanted back then, she continued, was the same as what the religious grieving mothers wanted. My daughter, here, now. Nothing else, God or no God, nothing else would do. And then this grieving mother made a most interesting observation. She said, religious grievers, in fact, have one burden of which I, as a non-religious person, was spared that of continuing to love and trust God. And that's the theme of today's first reading. How can we believe when God seems absent, indifferent, or even worse, when God seems to be the cause of our pain and grief? How can we believe when God isn't there for us? How can we believe when God stands idly by and lets us suffer alone? How can we believe when God is against us? The Bible is full of stories about people experiencing the seeming absence and strange silence of God. Some responded by getting hopping mad, giving God a piece of their minds and demanding justice. Some became aware of their own mistakes and confessed to God that they were only getting what they deserved. Others shed tears of pain and sorrow and waited in silence for God to be shown again. But there's one thing they all did in their own unique ways. They prayed. Whether God was present or absent, whether their prayers were answered or unanswered, they poured out their anger and hopelessness and shame and grief, unedited, uncensored, to the very one who had turned against them. In fact, most of the great prayers of the Bible, including the prayers of Jesus in Gethsemane and on the cross, most of the great prayers of the Bible were cries of the heart, emerging from the seeming absence of God or from struggle with God. And that's true of this morning's text from the Hebrew Scriptures. Israel had been in exile. She had been overrun by enemies. She had lost her homeland and had been forced to live elsewhere. It had been a long time since God had sent pillars of cloud by day and fire by night. It had been a long time since God scattered manna on the ground. And so it seemed to the Jewish refugees that God was no longer minding the store. Even though they had been allowed to return to their homeland, threats Divisions, land battles, and power struggles had erupted between and among the returnees. The restoration that had been envisioned of Jerusalem to its past glory was clearly not going to happen, at least not in the time and ways expected. Israel feels abandoned. She had nurtured a hope that God's forgiveness and favor would bring a return of their power and monarchy. Yet now it was getting pretty difficult to hang on to that hope. Hope was giving way to a profound sense of despair, estrangement, and alienation from God. Many of us have known times like that, 
times when we ask, why me? Times when we may even blame God, echoing the words of the Israelites in today's first reading so long ago, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. In other words, it's your fault, God. But even in the midst of our false blaming, there is the hidden kernel of a sense of expectation. Even in the midst of our false blaming, there is a buried longing that God will prove us wrong and show that God does care and is not absent. A hope for God to tear open the heavens and come down, as it was said in this morning's first reading. And all that we hope for does come. But God's gifts are often hidden in the form of the contrary, in their seeming opposite. God's gifts come in the form of the cross. The cross, which seems to be defeat, yet is really victory. The cross, which seems to bring death, really gives life. God's gifts and presence are often hidden in their opposite. And so whenever we feel abandoned or deserted or ignored by our God, it's time to remember the cross, to look back and recall that God's gifts and presence are often hidden in their opposite. And so when we encounter the opposite, we can have hope. When it seems as if God is absent or that God is against us, we can hope that the opposite is actually true. For God's gifts and presence are often hidden in their opposite. Hope. That's the theme of Advent. Yet it's a hope not based upon our immediate experience of life. The hope of Advent is based upon our trust in God, a trust which has seen the cross and so knows that appearances can be deceiving. Kurt loved birds. Every day he quietly placed seeds on a flat metal dish on the ground. At first the birds flew away in fear whenever he came to fill the dish. Eventually, two cardinals stayed cautiously nearby, and the other birds soon followed suit. One day, when Kurt came in, his mother was watching through the window. The birds have learned that you take care of them, she said. Now they trust you. Kurt and his mother watched the birds feeding contentedly. But then Kurt noticed a cat stalking slowly toward the feeding dish. Kurt tapped the window pane in warning, but the birds kept eating, for they weren't afraid of Kurt. He had to warn them, so he opened the door and ran out, shouting and waving his hands. The birds flew away nervously. Thank goodness, his mother said when Kurt came back inside. If you had not been there, that cat would surely have eaten those birds. But now, said Kurt sadly, now those birds will be afraid of me again. They won't understand that I did it for their own good. From our limited vantage point, appearances can be deceiving. And so we need to be reminded that from our point of view, God's gifts are often hidden in their opposite. Therefore, we can trust that God is in control even when we do not see or understand God's plan. And we can be confident of God's presence, even when we feel forsaken. Advent, indeed all of this life, is walking the beach in the hour before dawn, when the night is at its darkest, when it's difficult to see. Yet as we walk the beach before dawn, we can see the faint signs of a new day already dawning. We can see hints of a great red glow, flickers of a future warming that will bring light and love to the world. We can see traces of hope promised to a world whose hope is at times all but extinguished. God is among us and God is for us although sometimes it sure seems otherwise. We have seen that Good Friday is followed by Easter, 
that the cross, which seemed to be defeat and death, was really victory and life. We have seen the cross, and so we know that God's very presence is often hidden in God's seeming absence. God's love is hidden in seeming indifference, and God's action in seeming inactivity. We walk the beach in the hours before dawn, but the sun is on the horizon. The new day is already dawning, and God is at work. Sometimes we just can't see it yet. Amen. God of power and might, tear open the heavens and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need as we pray, saying, Hear us, O God, and responding, Your love is great. We pray for the ministry we share in Christ's name. Open our hearts to your call for social justice, peace, and healing. Attune us to the needs of the world as you draw near. Hear us, O God, your love is great. We pray for this planet in need of restoration, for devastated habitats, polluted waters, thawing ice, blazing fires, swelling floods, and long-lasting droughts. Renew the face of the earth and our relationship to it. Move us to lower our carbon footprint and to care for the poor hurt by global climate change. Hear us, O oh God, your love is great. We pray for all people who care for others in our community and around the world. Fill them with compassion and the power to respond with social justice for those who are oppressed, with welcome for those who are excluded, and with relief for those who suffer. Work for peace in the Middle East after the death of the top Iranian scientist. Hear us, O oh God. Your love is great. We pray for people who are in crisis as the seasons change. For those without homes facing severe weather. For those who are unemployed or underemployed. 
and for those in poverty or facing food insecurity. We pray especially for the million people displaced due to conflict in Ethiopia. Relieve their burdens, sustain their bodies, and ease their minds. Hear us, O God. Your love is great. We pray for the people in our families and congregation who live with depression, anxiety, chronic pain, addiction, and other invisible illnesses, and for all whom we name before you. ease their suffering, and use us to support them when they struggle. Hear us, O God. Your love is great. We give thanks for the lives and witness of those who died while waiting for justice, peace, or healing, those whose names we know and those whose names are known only to you. Sustain all who still yearn for the completion of your redeeming work. Hear us, O God. Your love is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share that peace.
Go in peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.